Well, good morning. Uh, as always, a joy to be with you uh, this Lord's Day. I feel like I'm in a, a new sanctuary. Uh, so thankful to the sowers and, and all who have helped with the, just the, the spruce up of our sanctuary this past Amen. week or so. Uh, another thank you. Uh, thankful to all who participated, served, and, and helped in supporting uh, our Guatemala team yesterday. Uh, I'm told they raised around $1,200, which is the cost of one complete person and one whole teammate to go. Uh, on the trip, and so thankful for that, and for you guys eating pancakes and shopping at the garage sale and doing all the many other things uh, that went into it, and thankful for the team as they're preparing uh, to go over in a few short weeks, about a month. Well, we have an exciting time before us this morning. We're going to be continuing in our study of Matthew's Gospel and chapter 13, and I say it's an exciting time. All of Scripture, any time that we're in it, is a, is a time that is exciting, but I would point us this morning to understanding that, that this is pertinent and relevant to each of us in, in, in so many ways, uh, as is all of Scripture. But this morning, I, I would draw us to recognize how much we desire recognition and acceptance because of who we are or where we are or because of how we live. Uh, I see these bumper stickers, maybe you've seen them. People put them on their car to identify certain characteristics. They might say, for example, salt life. I saw some when I was near the whitewater rafting communities that says river life. I've seen some around here that say beach life. I've seen mountain life. I've seen all kinds of different designations by which people are uh, seeking to be recognized, accepted, and known for. And so I've entitled this sermon this morning, Kingdom Life. And as we begin last week, in this section that we're going to be in, we begin by looking at these six parables. There's seven actually in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we looked at the first one many weeks ago, the parable of the soils and its explanation. Uh, but this morning, we're going to... Uh, or last week we looked at the other six remaining as a single unit, uh, an overview, so to speak, a, a big picture. But this morning we're going to focus in on the tares among the wheat parable of our Lord and its explanation for the very specific purpose of helping us to know and to grow in the midst of uncertain times. You know, this world has always been fascinated by the battle between good and evil, you may know that, you, you may recognize it, you might not even realize how true that is, but it is the basis of, of many books and movies uh, throughout history. And as a matter of fact, if you're familiar at all with these things, it's kind of formed its own niche in our society in the form of comic books, where, where people will use artistic license to create characters on both sides of the battle and endow them as needed with special abilities for this battle that is before them. You may be familiar with the movies, but you might not know the background that the author J.R. Tolkien was in fact a believer, and he used this broad spectrum concept of good versus evil as a basis for his very popular series, The Lord of the Rings. To be fair, we all desire a utopian world. But in all fairness, we also recognize that it doesn't actually exist. We feel the weight, the pain, the struggle, the desires that are unfulfilled, the plans that are unmet. All of these things are universal to every one of us. As we consider this, I'm reminded that as Christians, we believe that in this picture, we are the ones or those who stand for the forces of good. That we are on the right side, so to speak. And so what, what are we to do? How are we to act and respond to the evil which exists, to the struggle which is real? Should we, like our favorite comic book characters, begin to think of ways to combat it? Unique and novel things to carry out. The question is, how should we as believers act in the midst of a fallen world? How should we live our lives in the midst of the struggle that is so real? I would say that these are necessary and pressing questions. They're questions that we should be 
faced with on a regular basis because of who we are, because of what we stand for, and because of the realities that exist. But I would say to you this morning, as I would say to you each week, thankfully, these are questions that have answers. We're not left stranded to try and guess and figure out and hope we get it right and hope it's not a mistake and hope that maybe we wouldn't do the wrong thing, but in fact, we can know what is right. And so with that, read with me in Matthew 13. Again this morning, Jesus is teaching regarding these matters that we're faced with. We'll begin in verse 24 and go to 30 and then jump to verse 36 down to 43. Jesus presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and then went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have these tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slave said unto him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. For while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now just a few quick details before we continue for the non-farming community that probably is all of us in here. Especially in this context, the tares... And the description that's given were likely a wheat or a weed in that time known as darnel. It was a noxious weed that resembled wheat, and it would not be recognized as that which was not re- wheat until the plant was firmly rooted. And you see that, that it wasn't until the time that the wheat began to bear seed that it became evident of the other not being truly wheat. As I mentioned last week, this was apparently a common practice. As there was a law on the books regarding the criminality of someone doing this to a neighboring farmer. And so with that little bit of information, a few verses later, we see the disciples who would have understood that part of the context, but would not have been able to connect it to, well, what does this mean about us, Lord? How is this like the kingdom, this story about a farmer whose enemy sowed Darnell among the wheat? Read with me in verse 36 and down as Jesus explains. Then he left the crowds and he went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels." So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, he who has ears let him hear. Now last week we looked at the big picture realities of these parables, realizing very simply that Satan is constantly opposing God's plan. However, our Lord is sovereign and his plan will not fail. These parables are in fact instructions for the Christian's life in the face of or in spite of enemy opposition. And they're given as faith boosters for us in the midst of struggle as they declare the end is set. That we can know what's coming. That we don't have to wonder and worry and fret in the midst of uncertain times or circumstances. It is in fact a chapter of declaration and explanation of the big picture of God's plans and what are our roles and our hopes in the midst of it. Having seen what is, what is the big picture of these parables, I want to focus this morning on five truths that are illustrated for us as we are called to live in this season between the advents of our Lord. Christ has come. We're reading about that in this very text as he was here on earth. We know the account. We celebrated his birth at Christmas. We're going to celebrate his death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter. We know the account of the life of Christ. 
But we also know that he is coming back. And we are those who are in the middle. We live between these two advents. And how then should we live? How should we live our life as we, as we know the truth of his coming and what he's given to us in our salvation, our kingdom citizenship, and yet as we await the culmination of his kingdom when he will return and accomplish these things, we live in uncertain times and difficult things by the daily aspect, but in the big picture, we know the end. And so I want to look at five truths that are illustrated for us in this parable regarding our lives today. The first one is that our king is sovereign. We have a king who is sovereign. We see that in this picture. Jesus says that the sower here is himself. As he, as he references in an explanation that the sower is the son of man, this is a designation that refers to him. He actually explains that further at the end of the explanation when he says that when the son of man returns with his angels... And there can be no doubt that this reference is in regards to himself. And so the sower in this parable is Christ himself. And what he sows or plants, if you're not familiar with that terminology, he plants are the sons of the kingdom. What we saw earlier in the parable of the soil is that there are sowers that we ourselves are sowers, but that we sow the words of the kingdom, but here Jesus makes clear that he is the one who actually plants kingdom sons. Now, this is so important for us in regards to our roles in the kingdom mission. The great commission that we looked at during our missions conference, the go therefore and make disciples commission that Christ gave unto all who were his as he ascended into heaven. It teaches us so much in regards to how we're to do that. We are to sow the seeds. The seeds of God's word, the words of the kingdom, but we must trust in Christ for the results. Now, this is so important for us. A major component of kingdom work is evangelism, sharing the gospel, telling others about our salvation, being always ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us, being bold with these things and declaring the words our Lord has given us unashamedly. And so it's important for us to see this rightly. We must not be tempted to see ourselves as unnecessary in the kingdom plan. And this parable gives us a both and picture of the tension that exists. Our God is sovereign and yet he chooses to use us as a means to the accomplishment of his sovereign plan. And yet we can be tempted. I've heard things like, well, if the king is the one who actually plants his kingdom, why must I bother spreading the seed? If I'm going to spread the seed, I mean, really, We've just been taught that I'm spreading seed across this world and it falls on three out of four bad soils. That I'm not even hitting 50%. That the majority of people are in fact going to be those who are on the broad road and that leaves me trying to spread seed in such a way that it's going to fail most often. I mean, let's reevaluate this. Does he really need me to do this? And the answer is no. God does not need you to do this, but... To be clear, we see throughout Scripture and certainly in this parable that there is a measure whereby we must be used in the kingdom plan. But we struggle with that. I mean, honestly, if it's up to the king to do it ultimately, then does he really need me to go to my neighbor who is likely going to reject the gospel and now will reject me and I have to live next to them? Or my coworker? I mean, work's already enough of a struggle without having to have a separation over something this important between us? Is it really necessary to risk rejection if Jesus is the one ultimately responsible? I mean, can't we just let him do it so I don't have to work with someone who rejects me now because of him? And we can't even begin to consider those living in a foreign land. I mean, really, we should let the king deal with them. And yet scripture is so clear that God's plan includes his people as necessary for the spread of his kingdom. There are workers involved in every element of this and yet we need to be clear. It is our Lord who sovereignly plants sons from among the seed that we have sown. 
it's clearly stated continually. But the flip side of that and what we need to take into perspective in learning from this truth is that we should never be tempted to see ourselves as the only necessary part of the kingdom plan. If you've heard me speak of the tension that scripture gives us continually, here it is. This is the tension whereby we see that it's up to our Lord to accomplish and yet he calls us to participation. There's a tension there that our logic and reason will struggle with. Well, if it's not necessary, then why bother? And yet we see clearly the truth of that. But then the flip side of it is when we fail three out of four or more times according to the preparation our Lord has given us and the types of soils we will experience, We can be tempted to see ourselves as needing to do more, to change things. Brothers and sisters, I can tell you with authority from God's word that we are not salesmen tasked with closing the gospel deal. We are in fact heralds who are commissioned to spread the word that he has given. It is never to be a debate nor an argument. And we are certainly never authorized to change his message even in the slightest. We have to understand this. We are to be those who, through lives of faithfulness and faithful proclamation of truth, spread his seed, spread the seed of his word, the truth of his gospel, and then rest in him for the results. It's that which gives us the ability to continue this task. Because if I thought it was all up to me, I would lose my sanity or I would change the message. If I believe that, I would never be able to simply sow with faithfulness the truth of God's word. It is an amazing burden and a great freedom all at once. Here in chapter 13, our Lord prepares us for the work of the kingdom and the peace we have as to the outcome. Think of that. We who have met the king have a desire to please him. As his citizens, and he commands us as his citizens to go and tell others, even as he tells us, that he is in control of their response. And you think, well, how is that logical? It's not. It doesn't fit within our worldview. That's what makes him who he is. It is like working for a boss who says, go and do this exactly this way. And whatever happens, you will be paid as long as you do it exactly as I have told you. You don't change it. You don't, you don't jump around with it. And that makes sense to us if we know him rightly because you and I don't know what tomorrow holds, much less the end from the beginning. But the one who commands us knows all things and is in all ways good. If you were part of our men's study on Wednesday night, we walked through the realities of God and why it is that we trust him that truly his commands are the absolute best for us. And we understood that because he is sovereign. He is in control of all things. Number two, not only is he a sovereign, he is also infinitely and perfectly wise. He wields his sovereign control with perfect wisdom. And more than that, he is perfectly good in all things. He is the father of lights from which every good thing comes down and there's no shadow of darkness within him. And so, our Lord sovereignly wields his goodness In every area with perfect wisdom. Therefore, you can trust him. It's an amazing burden and freedom all at once in regards to the command of discipleship. The command of evangelism. And it's one that we would do well to learn. And so the first implication or illustration of truth that we have is that we need to be reminded that our our God is sovereign. That the son of man, Christ himself, is the one who plants sons in the kingdom. And that neither negates our role as workers to the king, nor does it negate the way in which we're to carry that out. One of the biggest things that will happen, and it's been so clear in our generation, is that when we don't trust the Lord for the results, we change the method. We change the message. Well, maybe I can convince this person with just a little sleight of hand. We won't tell them about sin. We'll skip that part and just jump to salvation. Brothers and sisters, you can have no salvation apart from recognizing sin. The Lord himself sets that example. He gives it completely and clearly in every instance. And we ourselves would do well to remember that. If if you consider rightly the illustrations that are given in these kingdom parables, then we understand 
He's the king. The picture that's given, by the way, just the, the very word in the Greek for, for preacher is the term that we would recognize from which we get herald. A herald, that's what we're to be. That's what I'm to be, a herald of the king. Can you imagine just for a moment how it would go in an earthly sense? And here in America, we, we probably don't understand uh, royalty in those terms. We, we don't live under those uh, designations of government. But most of us have at least enough history or seen enough movies that we do understand a little bit about it. And so with that, imagine if just for a moment, that I was in a society, we lived in a society that was under the totalitarian rule of a king. And in that society, the king said to me, I want you to take my message. I want you to be my herald and I want you to go to the next town or province over. And this is what I want you to tell them. And as I go there, for a variety of reasons, maybe out of a fear of man, it's an unpopular message. Maybe they won't receive it well. And so I arrive there and I think, you know, I'm, <laughs> I don't like to be this unpopular. And so I'm going to change the king's message just slightly. I'm going to change it just enough so that it's not rejected by three out of four people here who look at me as the messenger and, and judge me and hate me because of it. And so I shift the message and it's wildly received and I'm greatly popular and things are going well and everyone receives me well. And then the king shows up. Think about that. Or what if out of other motives, out of a desire that the king is far distant and what will he know? And so as I'm here, I'm going to set up my own kingdom. And so I'm going to preach a message or proclaim, herald a message that puts me at the center of all things. I'm here to tell you that the king put me in charge. I'm here to do these things and you're to pay taxes to me and you're to build me a house and you're to carry these things out. Can you imagine how that will go when the king arrives and says, my herald said what? This is the picture for us to understand rightly. And we see this being declared here in this parable of the tares amongst the wheat. The second one is another one that we struggle, it seems, with greatly. And this is what I want us to understand. Our enemy is real. There is a true and real enemy. And sadly, this is a very hard struggle for us to maintain today. It doesn't seem like it should be. It seems like just reading the pages of Scripture would be enough for those who are professing Christ to say, oh, yes, he is real. It seems like as we look around the world that it would be enough to say, there is something wrong. And yet we, we struggle greatly to maintain the reality of our enemy in this generation. And it, it shows itself in two main ways. The first one is that Christians will live their lives naively as though there is no enemy. I've often heard, and I could not find who to attribute it to, there were multiple people, but you may have heard this, that the greatest tactic of the devil is to convince the world that he doesn't exist. And that's a reality that we, that we struggle with. And brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me today. As a citizen of his kingdom, you have taken on his enemy. That's just the truth and reality of it. As a citizen of his kingdom, you have taken on his enemy. And as the enemy hates him... He also hates you. Isn't that what Christ prepared us for in John 15? For his disciples, he said, As the world has hated me, so too it will hate you, because you are not of this world. You were of this world, but I called you out of the world. Therefore, as the world hated me, and you are no longer of this world, it will also hate you. This enemy hates all that you stand for, which reflects him. Understand this. I see this mindset where Christians... We'll just go blithely through life as though none of this is real. Hear me today. He, he hates your marriage. Do you know why? Because it's a picture of his gospel. Ephesians 5 says that as clearly as we can see. He hates your marriage because it's a gift from our heavenly father. He hates your study. He, he wants to interrupt any opportunity that you may have for the true knowledge of the one who called you. He hates that you would ever mature, that you might through practice discern that which is good from that which is bad. He hates your study. Have you ever noticed that? Isn't it hard to have a disciplined time of study in God's word? That's because your enemy hates for you to ever grow in that way. You know what else he hates? He hates your fellowship. 
He hates for you to be around like-minded believers who will grow you and hold you accountable to the things of God's word and, and teach you and shepherd you and help you in all ways that there will be discipleship happening. He hates that. And I think the one thing that he probably hates most of all is he hates your testimony of the grace of Jesus Christ. He is constantly seeking in each and every way to disrupt that, to call that into question. You know, it's, it's really the only thing he can take from you. It, it, have you ever thought about that? Satan does not have the authority nor power nor ability to take your joy. Satan does not have the authority, the ability, nor the power to take your salvation. Satan does not even have the authority to take your life. The only thing that he has the ability to take from you through your own choice, is your testimony of Jesus Christ before a watching world. He hates every kingdom aspect of who you and I are. The second way this shows themselves is, is there's a, a sense whereby when, when stuff comes and struggles happen, we tend to blame God. Look at verse 27. It's interesting that as these darnell or these tares begin to show themselves among the wheat, what did the servants of the, of the landowner think? They came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your, in your field? How then does it have tares? And I would put this before us. How easily tempted are we when life is hard or when the world around us looks particularly bad to question our Lord? <laughs> God, how could this happen? God, how, how could this world be so broken? And we forget. We forget that we know this truth. We forget that in Genesis, in the perfection of God's creation and all that was eternally good, Satan offered something less. And we, we can't really blame Adam and Eve too much. I mean, they made the first choice, but it's not as though you and I haven't made thousands of the same choices repeatedly. We chose something less and yet like Adam and Eve we tend to forget where this comes from we we blame God God how could this happen oh I know how it happened God this woman whom you gave me well God honestly it was this snake whom you created we blame the Lord God how could this happen how about this one God God where are you as though somehow the omnipotent, omniscient creator, redeemer of this world fell off his throne in the midst of what you're facing. God, where are you? Maybe this one, God, where were you? You ever been tempted with that? God, God, where were you? And so in this, our, our Lord is preparing us as believers for the reality of life in a broken world which is filled with the evil effects of brokenness. And we experience that. I don't know if you fully understand this, but there's a noetic effect of the sin that came into this earth, meaning that it's going to increase and it shows itself in an increasing way across this world. In other words, as your body grows older, you begin to experience the effects of sin. Now, it could be your specific sin, choices you've made that have led to some of that, or it could very simply be the effects of a broken world in which sin has entered in and caused these things. And we see that. Our Lord is simply in this parable preparing us for the reality of a broken world which is filled with the evil effects of its brokenness. And especially he calls us to understand that we are those who are living in a period of time when to use his word, we live amongst the sons of the devil. And therefore, the world we live in will reflect this. When you think about this, and this is a struggle we have, right? It, it's not specifically what our Lord's saying, but we, we want to believe that there's somehow a big middle area. That there's really bad guys like, like Osama bin Laden or you fill in the blank. And, and then there's, there's really good guys, you know, like, like Billy Graham or you fill in the blank. And somewhere in the middle, there's this hodgepodge of the rest of us. It's not what Scripture teaches. Scripture says that there are those who are the sons of God by faith in Christ alone, and there are those who are the sons of the devil there's no in between. There's no one who's almost a Christian. And I would say this even further for you parents out there. God does not have grandchildren. 
Your children are not his because they are yours. Your children are his because they will have trusted by faith in him alone the salvation he has brought. And we need to understand these truths. And our Lord is preparing us for these things. He is preparing us clearly for that, for us to understand that in this period of time we live in, there's going to be brokenness. That it's going to be reflected all around us. That we live in a time period where there will be those who will call evil good and will call good evil. But we must never. That's the simplicity of what our Lord gives us here. Be prepared. There's going to be tares among the wheat. That you're to be those who grow up and produce goodness through the fruit that he's given you that your life be a reflection through the fruits of the spirit of all that he has accomplished we must be those who live in the midst of but never ourselves are of and our lord makes that clear continually he tells us that we live in a world that will respond with hatred but we must not ever it can't be more clear and that brings us to our third implication, and this is, this is a huge one. It's all over the pages of Scripture, and yet we struggle. And before we go further, let, let me just remind us of what our Lord taught in the Sermon on the Mount. He said that those who think certain things have already committed those things before him. That he cares specifically about our thought processes. So before you think, that's not me, Think to how your mind and heart reacts to these things. Our third implication is that Jesus Christ makes judgment in war. We do not. We do not. It's so important for us to understand this. And scripture teaches it continually. Are we ever to take vengeance? By no means. Are we ever to deal with others as they have dealt with us? By no means. We deal with them how? We're to treat others as we would have them treat us. Not as they have treated us or we expect them to treat us. We're actually to love our enemies. These commands are given all over, but here our Lord puts us a picture of practice. We are do not pluck out or remove the opposition. He will. He will do that. This is so hard for us to hang on to, isn't it? Maybe not in practice, but in thought. Maybe not in the carrying out of, but in a heart's desire. Historically, there have been epic failures as men like Charlemagne conquered much of Europe and is reported to have offered the vanquished armies before him on the banks of a river. This is what he would offer them. They could either have the choice of a baptism of conversion or a baptism of drowning at the river's bank. The Crusades sought to re-Christianize Jerusalem by force. The Catholic Church burned men at the stake who confronted their views. Let me be clear, lest you think that somehow this was led astray Christians. These are all signs of false Christianity. There's no servant of the Lord who would ever go and carry these things out. That's the point that's being made. These are all signs of false Christianity. As our Lord has clearly said, this is not the way of his citizens. His citizens will not behave in this way. Even as we would not do such things, I pray, it would not even associate. It's a little offensive to think of someone doing such a thing and in the name of Christianity. And, and we get labeled with that, by the way. If you've ever shared, and I pray you have shared the gospel with unbelievers, this comes up quite frequently. But even as we would not associate ourselves with those who do such things, I see us look with disdain and even hatred towards those who disagree with us. I've seen men divide over politics to the neglect of the gospel. Shame on us. There's no other way to put it. That we would uproot and divide apart from the gospel. I've seen Christians try and argue folks into the kingdom. When you have an argument, know this ahead of time, nobody wins. It's never intended to be that way. We are called to trust in him and in his plan. 
We are to be gentle and patient with those who are in opposition. We are to share the truth with love. We are to carry this forth in all things. We are to stand firm and movable. We don't change the message even though men will reject it. We don't change what is being done even though those, there will be those who call us intolerant because we see Christ as the only way of salvation. As he has told us he is. But we are certainly not those who bring judgment and make war. Anytime that someone does that in the name of Christianity, you should know they are in opposition to their king. And there's not those who would be in opposition to this king. They might be in sin and would repent at the truth of these words, but they would never carry forth in the fullness of it So brothers and sisters, we are not to become comic book heroes for the banishment of evil. As a matter of fact, our goal in this life is simply this. We are to be those who do not do evil ourselves to anyone and to trust the Lord with the evil that others would do. You want to change something about your environment? Live out your righteousness and share the gospel with those around you even as you pray diligently for them. That's what a believer a kingdom citizen is called to. The individual Christian must vote and act and live in accordance with righteousness, absolutely. But this righteousness must also extend to all those who oppose him or her on all of these things. It's crazy. People will come to me and say, we have to vote this way as Christians. And then I ask them, well, what about the part where we have to be gentle and reasonable and patient even as we vote? these convictions with those who don't. Did we forget that part? It seems easy to overlook. The Apostle Peter, writing to a persecuted people, by the way, when I say a persecuted people, understand under Nero, these were men and women who were being slaughtered. They were dying horrible deaths because of their allegiance to Christ as their king. And so when Peter wrote these words, he wrote them first and foremost to the original audience and by the Holy Spirit, we also have the application in our lives. But, but know that when Peter wrote these words, those who heard them were those who were dying in horrific ways for their faith. And this is what Peter says to him. First Peter 2, I'm going to read quite a few sections from here because I can't improve upon what he said. First Peter 2, beginning in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly he continues in chapter 3 and it's clear that we are those who are simply to do right in the face of evil listen to verses 8 and following to sum up all of you be harmonious sympathetic brotherly kind-hearted and humble in spirit not returning evil for evil or insult for insult but giving a blessing instead For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. 
And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing it is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. And as Brother Norm read for us from chapter 4 earlier, living rightly among unbelievers continues as a major theme for the apostle and concludes with a sobering statement in verses 17 through 19. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. You know, it's interesting that these come from Peter. Because we know that Peter would have first heard these very difficult truths from our Lord's lips during the time Matthew records for us. There's a measure where Peter was learning these truths in the very pages where we're hearing them. And we know that he did not adhere to them at first. Peter struggled greatly at times. But it is obvious by this time, he had come to understand these truths. It's amazing to me to consider Peter as the author of what we've just read. One of the ways in which we do this, one of the ways in which we do not repay evil for evil, one of the ways in which we do that which is good in the face of opposition, in the face of struggle, in the face of slander, is that we must realize that that we do not judge and make war, as I've said, but he will. He will. Oh, it's coming. And he will tend to it. He will take care of it. The description of his judgment here in our passage is clear, but it's not just clear here. It's abundantly clear all over the pages of Scripture that our king, when he steps back, know this truth. He is a lamb no more. That is finished. He came and completed all that he had come to do and offered salvation to all who would but trust in him. And the salvation that he offers, make no mistake, is a salvation from him when he returns. That if you are not one who has received his grace, you will in fact receive his wrath. And he will come, as we learn in Revelation, as one upon a horse with his robe dipped in blood, making war against all those who did not, did not worship him. And every knee will bow. There will be those who bow because of the grace which they received in this life. And there will be those who bow because he has shattered their kneecaps with a rod of iron with which he will rule the nations. This is the Lord in his totality. And there is no mistaking that in the description that he gives in this parable. There is no mistaking that in the records that we see of what will happen when he comes. And therefore, in light of that, brothers and sisters, how could you ever wish evil upon those who are in opposition to you because of the gospel, knowing what they will experience because of that opposition? We must never be that. Listen to Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, who was taken up into the third heaven and shown great mysteries that he might share them. This is what he shared with the church in Thessalonica as they faced persecution and struggle from unbelievers. The tares that are sown in this world that we live in the midst of. Verse 4, therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith. Here it is in the midst of all of your persecutions and afflictions, which you have thrown off and taken care of. No, which you endure. It's so clear what Paul's describing. Then he goes on and says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. But here it comes. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when, not before, but when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. 
These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Paul summed up well in his description of the Christian life, how we're to live it in the midst of our enemies in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 and following. Paul says, never, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Those are all encompassing terms, y'all. Never, anyone, it's pretty. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our fourth implication. Judgment is actual and hell is real. Verses 41 and 42 of Matthew 13. Jesus' explanation says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. His judgment is clear and clearly stated. He does not come against those who are from this nation or, or that, from this ethnicity or that, or from this political divide or that. He does not concern himself with their political affi- affiliation nor who their government is, but he gathers those who are stumbling blocks. Quite simply, those who are in opposition to his kingdom citizens. Through sin and through falsehood, which causes true believers to stumble. Remember, these are those who are planted by the enemy with a specific purpose. You think we have a great commission? So too do they. It's clearly seen there is a battle of good and evil. And our battle plan is what God has given us. And that's always been his way because it gives him the glory. I'm always reminded when I think of God's battle plan of Joshua. Joshua being tasked with taking the people into the promised land. I mean, think of filling the shoes of Moses. I would have said no right there. Nope, that's not for me. Filling the shoes of Moses and doing what Moses did not do, taking them into the promised land. And they come to the first battle, and it's a major battle, the the fortified city of their day, Jericho. And I can just picture as God gives Joshua, the commander of the armies, the leader of the people, his battle plan. And Joshua has to take it to his captains and his generals. I can see them in their tent gathered. Joshua, what has the Lord said? Shall we begin to build catapults? Are we going to tunnel under? How shall we take this impossible city? And Joshua, I'm sure, hesitated. Well, forget the catapults. Go get your trumpets. We're going to go for a walk for the next several days around this city. Logical? No. Easy to understand? Yes. To do? No. And so this is what we have. There's opposition to his kingdom citizens, but he's told us this is how you're to live. We don't get to make it up. We don't create super capes and other things for us to carry out this plan. We don't renegotiate the contract. We don't work out a better deal. We don't bring to him, this is a better way to do it, Lord. I don't know how you missed this. Jesus, you really messed this up. You did not understand the 21st century. If you'd understood the 21st century, you'd have never said these things. By no means. And those stumbling blocks, those who would...